Y'all have been asking for a video on this topic. We're going to talk about the sealed subwoofer enclosure that was invented by Edgar Vilcher in 1954. He called his design the acoustic suspension loudspeaker. The leading minds of the time told him that what he was trying to do was impossible. He literally proved them wrong. Let's learn about Vilcher and his impossible subwoofer. Now, Vilcher actually had a degree in art history, but he learned about sound reproduction while working on radios during the war. After the war, he set up shop and started fixing radios and building speakers. Vilcher noticed that back in the day when trying to reproduce bass frequencies, standard speakers could have up to 5% total harmonic distortion. And to Vilcher, that was unacceptable. On his way back and forth from work teaching a night class at New York University, he had an epiphany on how to solve that problem and it all centers around one of these things right here, a spring. He realized he could use a pneumatic spring and all that was required was sealing off the back of the speaker box. So this very simple idea that we take for granted today was groundbreaking and revolutionary in the 1950s. Now there's a really cool story behind the development of his first prototype. We'll get to more of that later. For now, let's take a look at what Vilcher created. How did Vilcher's acoustic suspension system work? The air in the enclosure acts as a part of the suspension for the speaker. It acts as a pneumatic spring. It's simple and brilliant. To make the pneumatic spring tighter, you just make the box smaller. And to make it looser, you just make the box larger. When you have a smaller box with that very tight air spring, it makes it more difficult to move the cone. So you do need more power to move the cone, but you also get more control over the cone. When the music stops playing, the cone returns to neutral position quickly and accurately, giving you that tight detailed bass that sealed enclosures are known for. And because we're dealing with physics, there's actually a lot of math involved in this, but all that math can boil down to one simple number, a parameter called QTC. This parameter summarizes the frequency response of a sealed loudspeaker. The accepted wisdom is that the optimal sealed enclosure will have a QTC of 0.707. So the idea is that you can take a specific subwoofer and then change the size of the enclosure until you get a QTC of 0.707. If you wanted to use something like WinISD to design your enclosure, you could go into the software and as you're setting it up, it'll give you the option to pick a QTC. Now you're not gonna be locked into a specific QTC when you do this, you can adjust it later. As an example, we're gonna design an enclosure for a pair of kicker 12 inch subwoofers. And what we get from WinISD is this response function. One thing I wanna make sure you notice is this point right here, this point is called the F Three. The F3 is the frequency where the output is down by three decibels. It's very difficult for a subwoofer to reproduce frequencies below the F3. Two other things that I want to point out are these numbers down here in the corner. The first number is the FSC. That number is, for all practical purposes, the tuning frequency of this sealed enclosure. The second thing is the enclosure volume. It's eight cubic feet, which is absurdly large for a pair of 12 inch subwoofers. So that tells me that a QTC of 0.707 is not the ideal alignment. In fact, it's comically absurd to put a pair of 12s in an eight cubic foot enclosure. In fact, Kicker lists the maximum box size for one of these 12s as two cubic feet. So why don't we try this in a smaller box. Why don't we try a three cubic foot enclosure, which is the green line here on the screen. Before we do that, I want to thank my patrons over on Patreon. I couldn't make videos like these without their support. With a special shout out to my $25 patrons, Dylan, Bo, and Baba. If you'd like to support DIY audio content, check out the link in the description and join us over on Patreon. So this green line right here is the three cubic foot enclosure. This gives us a QTC of 0.865. The green line doesn't drop off as soon as the blue line does. And then it has a little bit of a steeper slope. And that allows us to get a little bit of extra output down to around 50 hertz or so. The two lines end up crossing at about 45 hertz and the F3 for the green line is around 42 hertz which is only just a smidge higher than the f3 of the blue line so you're not really losing very much low frequency extension that's just fancy talk for hitting low notes 
but you get a box that's a whole lot more practical and it gives you a little bit more output in that 50 to 100 hertz range. Let's take a look at what happens if we were to put this in an even smaller enclosure. Let's use an impossibly small enclosure as an example. The red line here is a one cubic foot enclosure. So we're cramming two 12 inch subwoofers into a one cubic foot box. I don't even know if they would physically fit inside the darn thing. And what you're gonna notice is you get this big peak in output around 90 Hertz. So this box would be boomy and peaky and would generally not sound very good. And it's also not gonna play very low. The F3 is now around 53 Hertz. So basically anything below 53 Hertz, this enclosure is gonna be a complete dud. And now you can kind of see how changing the air spring in the enclosure can affect the tuning of the enclosure. So that tight suspension is a bit of a double-edged sword. A good tight suspension is gonna give you cone control, but you're gonna trade low end response for that. Let me show you what I mean when I say cone control. This right here is the cone excursion plot in WinISD, and we can see how much the cone moves at any given frequency. First thing I want you to notice is the red line. That's the impossibly small enclosure. What you see happening is the cone doesn't move very much at all, gets nowhere near X max. And on the other end of that, the oversized enclosure, the eight cubic foot enclosure. So anytime this enclosure plays below 39 Hertz, the speakers will exceed their maximum excursion, their X max. They'll become non-linear and you'll start to hear the distortion. Whereas the three cubic foot box fits in between the two just fine. That is the green line. At no point does it ever exceed its X max and that cone stays in control. And when you hear that tight, clean bass, you can think Edgar Vilcher and his wife because his wife actually built the prototype. You can read the entire story. I'll make sure to give you a link to it down in the description. So I posted a <laughs> poll on my community tab because I was curious as to how many of you are running sealed subwoofers and a non-trivial amount of you are running sealed subwoofers, but most people tend to prefer ported and that is likely because ported subwoofers tend to give you more output. We typically see sealed subwoofer enclosures used in situations where a ported enclosure won't fit. And we have to be really careful when making small sealed enclosures to make sure we don't make them too small like the red line that I just showed you. So when you find yourself in a spot like that where you're really constrained by the space, you don't wanna to run too many subwoofers or subwoofers that are too large in that tiny box. In that case, for example, you might just wanna run a single 10 or a single 12 instead of trying to cram a pair of 12s into a one cubic foot enclosure. After getting the kinks worked out of his prototype, Vilcher wrote his own patent application when he applied for his patent. Then he went out and tried to sell his patent, his idea, to some speaker manufacturers. And they all told him they weren't interested, not because it wasn't a good idea, but because it was literally impossible. They said they had teams of engineers and none of them could build what he was describing, so they didn't believe what he had created. He literally created an impossible subwoofer. So Vilcher partnered up with Koss, who was actually one of Vilcher's students, and they created a company called Acoustic Research, where they built their groundbreaking hi-fi speaker. At one point, they had cornered up to a third of the entire hi-fi speaker market. While they were running that company, they hired a guy named Joseph Anton Hoffman. You may have heard of Hoffman's Iron Law. That is the guy. To learn more about Hoffman's Iron Law, check out this video right here. I'm the DIY Audio Guy, I will see you on the next adventure.